Uh, again, you will not be seen if you do choose to um, leave your video on if we do this recording, but just to ensure again that everyone is aware of that. Um, and I believe that I'm trying to find the recording. Under more pause recording, or perhaps it's already. Recording. I'm already it's recording it, Sherry, so you can just keep going. <laughs> there we are. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so we, we will start going the presentation then. So, Cherish, do you want to go ahead and, and yes, it's our presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining the Building Financial Success uh, presentation. My name is Cherish, and I'm from Student Finance, and uh, my role at Student Finance is a financial literacy specialist, and I'm glad to be here, and we can talk about your financial resources, or a little bit more of um, trying to be prepared to be at Laurier. And today with me, there's Sherry, and I'm going to just pass um, this to her so that she can introduce herself, and then we'll start the presentation. Okay, um, and so my name is Sherry Mojan, and I work in the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, and I'm the Graduate Scholarship um, awards and or graduate financial aid, if I can say my own title correctly here, uh, and, and uh, awards officer. Um, and we will take questions during and throughout the presentation, but please try to um, put them in the chat as we're going along, as you're, you know, um, hearing information or you see a slide that uh, peaks, you know, sort uh, you have a question about, uh, you can put your question in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go over all of the questions in the chat, as well as take any verbal questions that, uh, that come up as well, if that's okay with everyone. That way we can just have a, a good flow with respect to the presentation itself. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to advance to the first um, slide for Cherish. So for today's agenda, we're going to look at some financial resources that are available, and then what is money management as a post-secondary student, as a grad student that are attending um, WLU, and then some of the resources that we can suggest, and also some student account information. Okay. So the first thing that we're looking at are financial resources. Um, as a student at Wilfred Laurier. We can go to the next one. Right. The first thing that we encourage all of our students to be aware of is that there are awards and scholarships and bursaries that students are eligible to receive as being a student at Wilfred Laurier. And in order to be considered for these, the main thing that you really want to be aware of during your studies is the student profile that's asked to be completed on your Lawrence account. It is going to be extensive questions that ask you your personal information. It could be financial information, your budget information, OSAP. It will range from a lot of questions, but it is a one-stop application that will consider you for multiple awards. So that's why there's a lot of extensive questions that you'll see on the profile. And the timing of it, it will be open now for students to complete their actual general profile, but you won't be really seeing an award or a bursary that gets added onto your account till your second semester. So it is something that it's not immediate or you'll see it progressing um, easily, but we highly encourage students to complete it so that you can be considered for all of the options. There are awards and scholarships and bursaries that are awarded to a lot of our students. And if you don't put a profile in, you just won't be considered for that pool. So definitely apply. I know there's lots of information in there, but you do have to apply every year that it, you're in your study. So it doesn't carry forward. So make sure that in August, in your uh, time when it's in spring, you kind of put it in your back of your head. Okay, so next year's coming. The profile is going to be open. I just need to complete that for my upcoming study period. And you will see it on your Loris account. Um, and the next slide will show some of the deadlines um, that you will see for these applications. So the general student profile is now open and it will be open till October 5th. So while you start your studies, you can still complete your general profile, but please, 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 there is a deadline date. So don't miss your deadline date and also complete. And if you have any questions um, for your general profile, you can reach out to Service Laurier and then we can, if it is specific that it could be connected to student awards. So we will be in 
uh, here to help you if you have questions. And if it's a budgeting question or anything that you're inputting that you have questions towards and you need somebody to look over, then I am here. So for financial literacy, you can reach out to me. So these are the deadline days. They're posted on our website, but definitely um, be aware. And even though you have completed all of the information, I'll reiterate that it's October 5th, but you won't really um, see it moving because it has to be um, reviewed and go into pools of what type of awards are being awarded. And if they have to go through that process, which will be, then be completed for your second semester. Okay, now um, we're gonna go through OSAP. So OSAP is one of the resources that our students will be using if you are, um, if you are a student in Ontario. So it's based on your financial needs. So it's not based on your grades or your merit and it and comprised with grants and interest-free loans. So while you're a full-time student at an approved program, you can have interest-free status for your loans. So if you don't know, if you don't, if you have more questions, you could definitely read through the Ontario.ca OSAP website. It will give you an extensive um, knowledge of what it means, but feel free to reach out to us if you have questions regarding the student loan program. It is definitely um, a source that students will utilize because it will consider your living allowances and costs that are on top of your um, student fees and tuition. And it is a program that it's basically the only government program that students can have at this time um, that will consider your living allowances. Next slide, please. So as I said, for eligibility, you do have to be a Canadian citizen, permanent resident, or a protected person, but also an Ontario resident. So the Ontario residency is defined through the OSAP, like the provincial ministry. So it, it might not seem to be the same as what you would consider Ontario resident. So if you have questions, you can reach out, but it will outline on the OSAP website. You have to be currently enrolled in a certificate or a degree diploma program that is approved through OSAP. So not all programs are OSAP eligible. And um, we have a student page, like a financial aid page, that gives you our ineligible programs that are listed. So if you are not sure and you are taking a graduate program that you don't know if it's OSAP approved, I would strongly recommend just go on to our student, um, student Laurier website and then uh, find out if your program is covered through OSAP. And the funding itself, like the funding eligibility is determined by financial need and it's very uh, personal account that gets determined. So not everybody is going to see the same amount, even if you're in the same program, even if you're, if you think that you're in this similar circumstance as your friends or your peers. So please um, be mindful that each year too, even when you're in the same program that you're, uh, that you had funding from last year, there are a lot of factors that determine your eligible cost and your allowable financial resources. And sometimes it may not just be your input, it could be change in government funding. So there are a lot of factors that makes um, the eligibility move. So we encourage you to be um, aware of the OSEP application and where to find these information and just be familiar with how the messaging comes through through the system. Next slide, please. So as I said, you really want to be reviewing your funding summary. So a lot of the questions that I see sometimes from students are like, I applied it in July and I didn't know this happened when October came that nothing was ready or they were asking me for this or there was a change in your assessment. So OSAP is not just when you apply and get an assessment, it's final. It can change depending on your status, depending on your changes in your studies, depending on your resources that get reported. So we encourage you to periodically check and see. And if the ministry wants to verify information or financial aid office needs more clarification on certain requests, then the message gets sent through directly on your OSAP account. 
It's just that that's the most private and secure way to give you messages because it's your account. It's not something that everybody and anybody can have access to. It's only you and financial aid advisors that are um, approved through the ministry that could have access based on your permission. Okay, so keep in mind that you do have to treat it as your bank account that you have access to and that you're going to be checking it periodically to see what's happening. Sorry. Okay. I was trying to find my mouse. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for the next slide? As we well? are ready for the next okay. slide. Great. And it doesn't want to work now. <laughs> there we are. That's good. Okay. And on your OSEP account, um, your scholarships and awards are a resource that the ministry takes into consideration as eligible resources. So they do get reported as your resource and internal scholarships and awards from Laurier, they're automatically declared. So your studentships that you get or any bursaries that are internally award from Laurier will be um, reported automatically. So it's not something that you have to write in but it is going to be affecting your OSAP funding. External awards, depending on the scholarship and award that you may or may not have, um, it could be declared automatically or sometimes it will ask you to enter it in. So tri-agency, ODS scholarships are automatically declared and Sherry's gonna touch up on what they are in the next slide, but External awards, let's say from you get it from a different institution or a bank, or you, um, you've submitted a scholarship from an external party and you were awarded, you are required to um, report that as your award um, for your OSAP application. And depending on when those reportings get updated on your account, your OSAP assessment can change. That's why um, you really want to be aware of what other resources that you're receiving because they could change the amount that you're receiving. And unfortunately, it's gonna affect individual accounts differently because it's not a, a set amount that's set for every grad student that they can get and it deducts. It's personally where your um, financial need lies. And then as your resources increases, they could take away and say, okay, you have uh, more resources that could be directly used. So then we'll reduce the loan portion of it. And at the end of the day, I encourage all students to look for external scholarships, apply for them now, get awarded as much as you can, because that is your funding that you don't have to pay anybody back. Um, having high amount of loan, um, because you're in your graduate studies, you're grant amount through the OSAP is going to be different than your undergraduate studies because that's how the program um, is designed to. So if you can reduce a lot of your loan portion and get awards and scholarships that could pay for your tuition, that should be your priority so that you don't have a lump sum of loans when you are trying to um, start your career and build up your uh, wealth. And that's and I'll hand it off to Sherry. Okay. So I'm just going to. Uh, you, do oh. we want to answer, Selena? Do we want to answer a couple of the questions in the chat just because there have been quite a few? Or would you still like to wait till the end? We, we can do that if, if you're okay with it, Sherry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. good. I just don't know how if they relate. Um, so we had a student ask, uh, there's no applications available for the current aid year and aid period to which you could apply. Um, they're unable to find it. Is that coming later? No. So OSAP is available right now. So it, it's just that, is it for bursaries, you know, or is this for, so OSAP application for 2022 and 23 is open. But when you apply, you have to make sure that you select September, like you have to start a new application and say September and 2022 as your start date then it generates a new application with the right study year. If you try to go back to my apps and start opening what you previously had, it won't open because all the deadline dates are passed. So make sure that you open a new one and say that it's available. And is this for, for Loris as well? Like no, so Loris is completely different. So Loris is through our university system. So it is, 
opening on August 11th, which is today's the first day that it's open. So if you don't see it on your Loris account, I'm and just we're talking about the general student profile here, yes. right? just to make this clear. OSAP is completely different from the general student profile. Exactly. So this is August 11th that the general student profile has opened on Loris, right, Cherish? Yes, yeah. exactly. So okay. if you are having difficulty seeing that, um, contact us after because it could be individual like accounts that needs to be looked at. But if it's available on your Loris account, it should come up as a general student profile and you will be able to complete it. Perfect, thank you. Uh, one other question was, do you have to apply to OSAP in order to apply for OGS? Sherry? No, no, OSAP and OGS are not, um, um, tied in the fact that you have to apply to one to be eligible for the other. One is a loan and grant uh, program, the OSAP program, and the other one is a scholarship program that is through the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, and it is completely merit-based. So there is a GPA um, eligibility requirement in order to be eligible to apply for that one. Um, and also note um, that um, when it comes though to bursaries, I'm not sure if Cherish, you touched upon this, um, but in order for Lori graduate students to submit a bursary application, do they have to apply for OSAP whether they use it or not? And, and, and that's oh, yes. thing, And is that something you could speak to? Yes, definitely. Thank you for the <laughs> reminder, Sherry. Okay. Yes. So it does take into consideration that you do have you do need to have an OSAP application in order to be considered for a financial need award or a bursary, just because it is um, an underlying thing that can be used to say that to calculate if you are eligible for a bursary or not. So, for instance, students do have an option to say that they are only going to be taking grant funding for their study period and not take loans. Then it might. Uh, factor in to say that if you're eligible or if you are really in financial need, just because um, the financial need bursaries or funding are limited. So what it does is it's trying to capture the students who have high needs and give as much as they could to the students um, in a wide range. So if you are compared to another high need students that you're okay to not take your loans and only take the grants, it could say, okay, so your need is less than the student who needs to take all of their funding. So I would recommend, even if you have the means to pay with, um, you don't have to take your loans, it is interest-free loans. So you can take them all. If you wanted to put them in a safe, secured space before you need to repay your loans back, or you just repay the loan portion right away so you don't incur interest, that is your choice. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the last thing we've just had a couple questions come in about can students have access to these slides after and then maybe we'll continue the rest of the questions for at the end. Yes, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print them to PDF because they're in a, pro a software program that you have to have a login to access. So I'm going to make sure that the slides are available in PDF format and any questions or links that you um, would like to follow up um, um, on, then you can just let uh, Cherish or myself know and we'll get those to you. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so I will move on then to the next slide. Thank you, Alina. Okay, so in addition to loans and grants and bursaries and, and other financial resources, the general student profile, which again, can't um, encourage you enough to complete that, please, um, because again, there's a lot of money um, that is available in terms of uh, money that Lori has to provide to graduate students. You just need to complete that general profile to be considered as Cherish mentioned. Um, you can also apply for external scholarships. Um, so there are some federal funding um, agencies that we call them the tri agencies and they provide scholarships, um, which are merit based and academic excellence your transcripts your past accomplishments that sort of thing are taken into a consideration when you apply for these. And depending on these ones in particular that I'm going to speak to right now are research intensive um, scholarships. So you do have to be in a research master's or PhD program in order to apply. If you're doing health research, then you would apply to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Uh, if your uh, research focus is on the natural sciences, then you would be applying to um, NSERC. 
Uh, if you are doing more social sciences or humanities research, then you would apply to SHRC or Social Sciences and Humanities, Humanities Research Council. So these three federal funding agencies have two different programs, one for the master's level, um, Canadian graduate master's, sorry, scholarship master's program, and one for those who are in the PhD or who are intending on being in a PhD. Um, in a following um, academic year, and that's the Canadian Graduate Scholarships Doctoral Program. Uh, in addition to the Canadian Graduate Scholarships or CGSD program for doctoral students, and CERC and SHRC, those two funding agencies also have agency specific uh, award programs. So um, the difference is, for example, the, the CGSD, uh, whether you're um, successful with CIHR and CERC or SHRC, um, it would be worth $35,000 a year. Um, if you are applying to SHRC and you're not awarded a CGSD through SHRC, you could be um, considered for a fellowship, which is $20,000 a year. Um, and for NSERC, um, you could be considered for a CGSD, which is 35, or a PGSD or a postgraduate scholarship, which is worth $21,000. And the duration of those awards um, could sometimes be anywhere uh, from one year up to four or four years with SHRC or one year or up to three years with NSERC, just depending on how many months of studies you um, have completed at the time of your application. And, and that's something that the federal agencies decide. For master's students, those um, uh, CGSM scholarships are worth $17,500. Um, and also at the doctoral level, you can apply for a Vanier um, Canada Graduate Scholarships um, uh, Award. Uh, if you are in a PhD program as of this September 1st, that Laurie, and that one is uh, worth a lot more. Uh, it is worth $50,000 per year and is usually up to a period of three years. So that's a great one to apply to if you are eligible and uh, you're in a research uh, or in, your, in a PhD program. Um, if you are successful at uh, winning um, a Canada Graduate Scholarships Master's or Doctoral Award, you can also apply for something called the Michael Smith Foreign Study Supplement that uh, provides students with an additional $6,000 uh, to the value of their award, whereby they can use that to go research uh, abroad with another um, faculty member at another institution who is uh, usually connected, obviously, to your um, supervisor and your research and all that sort of thing. Um, so there's lots of money um, from the federal funding agencies to, um, to apply for. Uh, again, all this information is on our external scholarships and awards uh, webpage from, for the FGPS, and I can provide that information to everybody afterwards. Um, there are also some provincial uh, funding programs. So um, the Ontario Graduate Scholarship Program, uh, which we had a, a question about already, and the Queen Elizabeth um, Graduate Scholarship, the second, sorry, Graduate Scholarship in Science and Technology. Those are both worth $15,000 a year. They are not renewable. So you do have to apply every year in order to be considered. Um, our application at Laurier um, will open in October 2022. Um, and we don't um, have a deadline until sometime in January. So there's lots of time to get that application in. Um, and then there's the Ontario Women's Health Scholars Award and the Autism um, Scholars Award. Those applications are due by December 1st. Uh, those are worth upwards of uh, $25,000 and change, um, depending on um, whether you're a master's student or a doctoral student. And again, all that information is on our, our website as well. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, um, there are a number of other scholarship, external scholarship opportunities that you can look at and apply for if you're eligible um, on our external funding and awards page. Um, there is also the My Tax program, which is not a merit-based program. Um, Again, for that one, you do have to have a research project or topic or major research um, um, project whereby your faculty member and um, a, a partner in the um, outside in the community, so whether it be an industry, um, an NGO, or a company who has an interest in the research you're doing, you partner together and basically write a grant proposal to MyTax and they approve funding um, based on whether or not they um, have the funding to support your research grant. And so that one's not based on your grades, but more so the research project that you and your professor and um, the industry partner uh, that you're working with have, have put forth uh, to MyTax. And it's going... Sometimes it likes to do this and I'll just, sorry, bear with me here. I meant to go forward, not backwards. 
The last thing that I want to touch upon just briefly um, is I'm sure for those of you who, uh, again, are in a research intensive program or a program um, which is um, eligible for funding, whether it be master's or PhD, um, you may have received a teaching assistantship, perhaps even a research assistantship and or a studentship. And so how those work um, is that your graduate teaching assistantship is for 130 hours of um, employment work um, on campus. The RA is slightly different in that the hours uh, per week are uh, determined by the research um, assistant, sorry, the researcher who is hiring you. They may have a need for somebody to um, complete some research work for them uh, for 30 hours over so many weeks, or it could be 100 hours over, uh, you know, the term, that sort of thing. And so the uh, hourly rate and the number of hours you would be working would be determined by the faculty researcher. So both the, the graduate teaching assistantship and the research assistantship are both paid out biweekly um, through payroll in, uh, in the way of um, a direct uh, deposit paycheck. So make sure that you are submitting your direct deposit uh, forms to um, payroll via their uh, student payroll web page, which again, we can direct you to if you're not sure where that is. Studentship is slightly different in that the studentship is a trainee stipend. So it's a lump sum and it's it functions very similarly to that of an award or a scholarship in terms of the way that you receive it. It goes onto your student account. It's applied first and foremost to any outstanding fees owing on your student account and any credit that is left on your student account after receiving the studentship and, and, and anything you may owe uh, for the term is paid off. You can then request a refund via Loris uh, for that amount to be direct deposited to your personal bank account. Um, that amount is something that would be reported directly to OSAP, for example, if you were to receive a studentship, very similar to those of you who might have some Laurier graduate scholarship, or perhaps you have an OGS, it's already on your student account, and those amounts would have been reported uh, if you uh, were also um, taking OSAP up for the, for the year. Well, the last thing I'd like to note is in terms of the amount of hours that you're um, technically permitted to work as a full-time graduate student as per the, um, sorry, the Ontario Council of Universities and the funding agencies if you are to hold an OGS or a Tri-Council Award or the Tri-Agency Award. Um, full-time graduate students are expected to treat their full-time um, studies as a full-time job and therefore um, you are permitted to work up to a maximum of 520 hours of on-campus work. So if you're thinking about, you know, hey, I have a TA in the fall, that's 130 hours. I have a TA in the winter. There's another 130 hours. So that still leaves you with 260 hours in total to take up an RA ship or, uh, you know, do something in the spring term. And that 520 hour max of on campus work, which is what we are looking at and talking at, about here, um, would be for the fall, winter and spring terms in an academic year. Okay, and we can answer any questions that come in about those things after. And I'm going to hand it back over to Cherish now. Okay, so um, I am a financial literacy specialist at Lordy. So the majority of the time, um, I am the person, if you have any questions when it comes to money management, you know all these resources or you know that the expenses are there and you need somebody to help you or assist you with how can I manage this properly so that I can move forward and also time it so that I understand and be confident about your finances. Where we're trying to do is everybody has to learn this skill in a life stage at some point. And if you can do it now, it's going to be tremendously beneficial to your next steps going forward. And it's just building habits that are going to be more benefit towards you. It doesn't mean there's one solution to everybody. And it's always a personal journey. So I'm here to meet you where you're at so that you're not too stressed with all of your financial um, stressors or thoughts because you want to make yourself to have a lot of options when it comes to finances as much as you can with limited resources. And it might seem that it could be, um, it might not be practical for you at this time that you can look at all of these resources, but you also have to know that being a student, it's not gonna be forever, it's gonna be temporary. So you just have to be better prepared so that you prepare yourself to move forward. So if we go to the next uh, slide, um, so, uh, things that I would look at is a detailed plan of how you manage, spend and save your money. 
or um, I suggest that when it comes to the word budget, I know in your head, there could be a lot of different emotions that are triggered, but budget essentially means it's a plan. It's a financial plan that could work for you. So it's different for everyone. So I would suggest experiment with them. If you need a journal, write it down. If you need an app to do it, do it. If you need a friend to do like peer um, evaluations or do it together, do it that way. Whatever works for you is the best budget. So there is no one one stop budget that can work for everybody. Um, I would suggest try downloading financial apps. There are a lot of free apps that students can use now and pick the one that you like because you have to like it in order to do it. So if the font or the video or the clips that you see are not what you like, then you're essentially not gonna open it again. So experiment, pick one that works for you. Um, one other tip is if you are having a goal to save or build wealth while you are in your studies too, also try to think of what are the ways that can, I can automate these factors so that you don't have to consistently make a decision for where you're gonna put your funding all the time. Because that hindrance, that decision-making process can just make you avoid the whole process. So if you have the means to do it, and if you want to know what are the options, um, basic thing is you also need to understand what type of funding that you would have aside that you can put towards, or is this even a possible thing? So you do want to think about these things. Consumer debt or credit card debt can be a distraction from your studies because it does cause a lot of stressors. So if you are constantly dipping into credit card or any other debt tools that you can't pay off 100% within their deadline dates, then definitely reach out to me. We can take a look at it and see what type of tools that you are not utilizing or if there's any tips for agencies that you can contact to get more benefits. And plan out the whole eight months or a year study because when you're a student, you don't have a consistent flow of income that's regular. If you're an RATA, you might get um, like consistent paychecks and payroll. But at the same time, you really want to plan out your entire study period to have an overview of at least like the big picture of it. So you understand you're definitely going to be shortfall at some point or you're not going, you're going to have access resources at certain times so that you know when to plan and how long you can sustain with what, what you have. So one other things that I get to um, just introduce and uh, let students know is that a lot of the times when we decide to spend money or to be um, utilizing things, it's not based on what knowledge that you know. You can get vast amount of information on the web now or through social media. There's a lot of people who talk about all of the financial resources, but when we decide to spend a lot of the times is based on your feelings and its emotions. So the more that you understand about yourself, why you make those decisions when it comes to personal finance, it'll make you a lot more head to recognize that and to deal with it, not just with your financial means, but as your like wellness piece. So this one is like a short piece that you could um, test yourself to see what your financial personality is. I'm not saying that this is gonna give you a lot of answers for what you do, but it's a good way of understanding, okay, my tendencies currently and the way that I um, look at finances, I'm here. But in my head, in two years while I'm in my studies, I want to be at a certain point. So you can start looking at where you're at um, objectively and also try to see okay, if I tend to do these things, what are the tips or what do I need to do to make me and to go to a place that I want to? So I would encourage you to try this and it's short, but it will analyze and say how confident you are or with your managing finances or where you're at. Now, another tool that we would, um, I would strongly encourage you to see is the FCHC is the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. So this um, 
federal organization has a lot of resources when it comes to your financial resources. And they also have like a student budget plan. This, it won't be an ongoing budget that you can use, but it gives you a lot of categories that you may not have thought about putting in your budget and also um, the snapshot of where you're at. So if you haven't um, explored the website of FCAC, I would strongly encourage you to look at all of the resources because it's very Canadian based. At the same time, it has a lot of tips, not just being a student, but being a parent, being um, a dependent or living, um, living, renting, or trying to buy a home. There's lots of stages that um, everybody can encounter and that it will give you um, resources that you can utilize. And one of the tips that we, um, why would, this, this will not work for everybody, but when you are trying to determine how much you're spending, it, this is one of the techniques that students or anybody can do, where you're trying to um, split out your funding that you have, that you always thinking about your expenses, but also investing in savings. So whatever financial circumstance that you're in, it could be very little amount that you can put towards your savings or investments, but you also want to think of it holistically, everything together, not just, I'm just gonna do this because I'm a student and I have no means to do the next. Even if you can't do it today, if you could put very little funds aside and start managing it so that you're prepared to put for your future, and then you're meeting your immediate needs, and then you're trying to, see if you can use it for your wants. Um, it's preparing you to have a habit to think about finances as a whole, not just one thing at a time. And life occurs while you're a student too. So we strongly urge you when you have your saving, um, emergency circumstances can happen. There are different things that could stop you or hinder you from progressing the way that you wanted. So we strongly urge you to just think about what am I gonna do if I get injured and I can't really work for three months? Am I gonna be okay to pay rent? Or am I gonna be able to sustain and be a student during this time without any additional income that I can physically be earning? So like there are lots of, it's not for one person, even if you had a lot of resources, um, there could be circumstances where you, you are placed in where you don't have any and that cycle happens to everybody, not just one person. So I encourage you to start being interested. If you need somebody to talk to about this, please reach out and I'll be, I can meet you in a session or just talk to you and have anything that um, I could share that could assist you to be a successful financial manager for your own finances. That would be the goal. So we can go into making and thinking about your financial emergency kits. Um, there are rules that some people are comfortable being prepared for three months to six months, but this is individual based and it depends on what your resources are. But you do need to start thinking of, if I'm going to put aside funding, why am I going to put funds aside? What timeline am I looking at to utilize this funding? So your emergency funds or Let's say nothing happens and that you don't have to touch your savings or emergency funding, then yes, great. Then you can rethink about what you have saved or put aside and say, okay, is this going to be used to pay down my debt? Or is this going to be something that I can use for a car that I need for a job or like life goals? So as much as you have academic goals, you want to start setting financial goals that while you're a student, what are you going to do after within the five years, what you would like to do? Because this is going to be a practice that you will, you will be able to use throughout your life. And now we transition into the student account information and we'll look at um, the next slide. And, and I'm wondering, before we transition, mm -hmm. um, Elena, are there a number of questions that you would suggest we might want to address or do we want to leave them? To yeah, them? there's about five or six okay. um, and they might be quick, but I can run them off. So is OSAP or OGS for international students? Okay, so 
OGS is open to international and domestic students, but again, they're two very different things in that the Ontario Graduate Scholarship or OGS program is a scholarship program and it's based on grades, right, merit, academic excellence, and OSAP is the Ontario Student Assistance Program, which again, uh, Cherish, I'm assuming everybody does need to be an Ontario resident. Yes, you do. You do have to be an Ontario resident and also have to be a domestic student. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're finding that Loris, the profile is still unavailable, uh, but we do know it just opened up today. So telling students maybe to check back tomorrow or Monday, and hopefully it's up by then. If not, kind of send an email your way. Yes. Um, another question we had, can part-time students work the same amount of hours as full-time students? And does this also include off-campus work as well? Those kind of key hours you mentioned? So those key hours are for full-time graduate students only. We, we don't monitor the on-campus work hours or number of hours that part-time students um, acquire in terms of the RA or a TA. Um, and again, we're only looking at those on-campus hours. Um, in terms of off-campus, so if you're uh, working at, um, you know, a, a grocery store, a restaurant, or a bank, or whatever it might be on your own time, uh, we, we don't have a means to uh, monitor that, obviously. However, just do keep in mind, um, speaking from experience, having been a graduate student who did need to work the entire time that I was a graduate student as well, that you just want to make sure that you're not you know, taking away from your studies, right? You also do need to treat your, um, your uh, full-time graduate studies as a full-time job. Um, and so if you're doing things part-time, then you probably have a lot more flexibility um, and a, a lot more availability than uh, obviously to, uh, to work. So that just to keep that in mind, okay? So that 520 rule is for full-time graduate students. Perfect. Okay. Uh, how can we apply for the studentship or is it automatically granted by filling out the, the student profile? Yeah, so a studentship is completely different from a um, scholarship or award that is granted through the gen general student profile. A studentship is something that if you have a faculty supervisor, so um, usually it's uh, some a student who is working in a research intensive master's program or PhD program, um, and if their advisor is able to provide them with a studentship, a lump sum funding in order to you know, help them out financially, support them financially so that they can you know, uh, not have to work and um, have some extra money to help pay with their tuition, that sort of thing. So it's not something you can apply for. It's something that a faculty researcher who has a research grant with one of the funding agencies uh, or some sort of external funding agency would provide to their graduate student if they have the means to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had quite a few questions around for RA and TA positions. Where do you find them? Who can apply? Can you apply to a position outside of your department? So I am not going to step into this too much, seeing as it's not really my wheelhouse in terms of understanding the um, recent um, um, unionization of graduate uh, teaching assistants. However, we do have a web page that explains um, the different positions, um, how you find uh, for your faculty and your discipline, what, pro what sorry, courses you can ask or submit a preference to be assigned a TA uh, to. So for those of you who were provided in your funding package with a TA, Here's where you want to go to this web page to look at, okay, if I'm a faculty of arts graduate student, let's say I'm doing my master's in English, I want to go to the faculty of arts on this graduate teaching um, assistantship page and I want to look at where is the Department of English and Film Studies and what courses do they have the need for a TA for, and I can submit my preference to the program. It doesn't mean they're going to assign you to the ones that you submit a preference for, but at least it, it gives you some voice in suggesting which ones you would like to be assigned to. Um, so again, for those of you who do not have a teaching assistantship, um, that is something that, again, 
usually at time of offer of admission, you would have been provided with um, an offer for a TA. And if you were not provided with an offer for a TA, then unfortunately, um, you more than likely will not be assigned one. Again, you, you would need to take that up with your graduate program coordinator of the, of the graduate program that you're in in order to, to find out more information about that. So again, I, I understand that there's probably a lot of links that we could provide that would be very helpful based on the questions. So what we can do at, at the end of the presentation, I know we still have a little bit to go here yet, um, is we'll make sure that we take um, a list uh, from the chat of the questions and I'll pro we'll provide Cherish and myself detailed um, responses, some links and that sort of thing. And we'll make sure that uh, those of you who are here and those of you who are not able to uh, attend today have, have those FAQs uh, completed and you have that at your ready, okay? Perfect, that sounds great. Yeah, I think we'll keep going. Um, yeah. Some of the questions are very kind of program person specific. Yeah. So I'll just let those students know if you have very specific questions about your program and that maybe sending an email after the FAQs come, if those don't answer that, uh, might be a better idea. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, especially um, and keep in mind that um, you have a graduate program coordinator um, who is there for you to speak to about all of these uh, sorts of things, your program specific uh, requirements, your course registration, TA assignments, these sorts of things as well. So you can definitely reach out to them as well. OK, I'll hand this back over to Cherish to speak about invoicing. OK. Okay. So your fees um, that you see on your account. So invoices are generally available on Loris approximately a month before your start of each term. So this could vary each semester based on what's happening, but in general, within a month, like closer to your study period, it should be letting you know what's due and how much it is. And fall fees do that, like all the deadline dates are due on the first day of classes. So for fall, it'll be September 8th, winter, January 9th and the spring 23 would be May 8th. Um, if you incur late payment, so you can't make up your full balance payment or you weren't able to make your payments, you will be notified that there will be um, pen payment penalties and it will be calculated based on the dates that um, the interest goes on. And we have a full page on the um, student's website where if you just search for tuition or invoicing, it will give you what are the payment options? What are the deadline dates? How to make them? And what if you're an OSAP student? All of the details will be on this on the page. So the preferred um, payment methods for your fees will be online banking. So it's mostly you would log in to your online banking payment and um, give Wilfrid Laurie as a payee. And then your student ID number becomes the account number. So you must have the correct student number to send your funds. So I would um, just double check when you're doing a fund transfer that you have indicated your student ID correctly and um, make the payments at least three business days in advance because like any, it depends on where you're banking. It might, you might have the transaction done on a certain day, but it may not be actually received um, by the deadline dates if you do it on the day of. So we don't encourage you to do it on the day of, but please do try to do three or four business days earlier. For international student pay, students can log, log on to the secure online CIBC portal and then initiate a payment with preferred method of your currency. And other ways to pay, either OSAP. Um, currently, because the service delivery offices are um, not fully open to students for to come in. So the debit payments are not currently available. So, but you can do it the same as online banking to transfer. And if you have any type of um, third party sponsorships or you're getting funding from a different um, resource, then it is going to be required to make the payments and we will receive them, but your timing could be different when it applies to your account. So just check with your provider just to understand when they're sending the funding, how it's going to be applied. And then you can also request, uh, if you have questions for them, to service Lori. Okay, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the tuition payment plan program, which is an excellent program. Um, and I highly encourage you to, to apply. It kind of obviously gives you a little bit of relief in terms of 
um, not having to pay on the September 8th deadline or for winter, right, the, the January 9th deadline. And same thing, we we have the program running in spring term as well. You don't have to pay all of your tuition in one lump sum. So instead, the payments for your tuition are spread out into three equal installments uh, throughout the term. And um, we get a lot of questions about the payment plan because um, there are a few different terms <laughs> regarding when your payment is due, right? The effective installment date and then the due date for that date. And I'm just going to explain that a little bit. So first and for foremost, in order to apply for the plan, it is a $50 administration fee, which I know is a little um, uh, unfortunate, but at the same time, it does cost a lot of, um, uh, of man hours, if you will, or person hours in order to uh, get this uh, plan up and going each term. And that, that's the rationale behind this. So what happens is you apply for the plan. It makes best sense to only apply if you have approximately $1,350 uh, or uh, more owing on your student account uh, for each term after maybe OSAP has, you know, paid down some of your money or, you know, you're getting some lower graduate scholarship funding, or perhaps, um, you know, you're getting OGS or whatever it could be. Um, so make sure you actually have um, that $1,350 owing or more. Otherwise, it's a waste of the $50 administration fee to apply. Um, because yes, if you can't pay that $13.50 down very quickly and you have to take your time throughout the term to pay it off, you will incur some late fees, but it'll be much less than the $50 administration fee to, to apply for the uh, plan. So the application for the fall term payment plan is open. The deadline is August 24th, which isn't that far away. I highly encourage you, if you don't think that you're going to be getting any OSAP or other funding that you know of, um, if you currently have your... Um, uh, tuition and fee balance for the fall term, which hopefully you do because you've registered for the fall term, hopefully, <laughs> um, then you should know what your balance is and whether or not it makes sense to apply or not. What happens then is that close to um, early September, you will get a communication from Service Laurier that will indicate that you've been approved for the plan and this whole approval or, you know, will I get approved, will I not get approved? Really, what it is, is you're going to be approved if you apply. Uh, however, if you don't owe more than the $13.50, we will highly recommend you don't uh, apply and pay that $50 is really all it is. Um, and then what will happen is you'll have an installment effective date of September 4th, October 4th, and November 4th for the fall term. So you're going to pay your tuition in three installments. And there will be a separate due date for uh, September 4th is your first installment. It might be due uh, two weeks after the 4th or maybe three weeks after the 4th. That's dependent on the student accounts office. And then the October 4th uh, effective installment date, it might be due uh, two weeks after October 4th. And then same thing with the November 4th um, effective installment date. It might be due, um, you know, two weeks after that November 4th deadline. So that's, that's how the payment plan works. Um, um, again, I uh, highly recommend that for those of you who are in need of that. And do keep in mind that if you are not able to pay off um, your fall term tuition and fees through the payment plan by the end of uh, the fall term that you would not be eligible to then enroll in the plan in the winter term. Um, and that's something if you have questions around, we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, tuition payment plan continued. I did explain these dates, but just to go over them again, the first installment, if it's chunked into three um, payments uh, throughout the fall term would be September 4th, October 4th, and then November 4th. That is not the due date for the payments. You would have a due date and an invoice issued to you um, on Loris uh, for your student account for that September 4th. Uh, date and for that October 4th date and again for that November 4th date. Okay, so that's how that works. And our next slide is back over to Cherish. So I will hand the presentation back over to you again. So this is our like last bit of this um, presentation. And I'm just like, as we explained, there's a lot of resources and awards and bursaries and even um, work that is available for students as a grad student. Um, one thing that I would uh, strongly encourage you to do, if you haven't looked at managing finances on your own, or if you're not confident or you want to get more information, we strongly encourage you to register and enroll in a money management certificate course that's offered to all students at Laurie. And it will touch on budgeting basics, um, credit and debt management for investing, how do you start or what do you think of, and your financial future so that 
It's a general overview and there's no timeline. There's no grades that are attached to it. It's open to everyone. And um, I would just suggest look at it, get what you need. And there, you could go in at any time to look at the modules. As long as you finish it within your studies and when you're done your studies, um, it's open for everyone and it's free. So, and you have any questions regarding the modules, you can always give me feedback or if you want to see something different, please, um, I encourage you to um, give us the feedback so that I can work on or to our department could um, research and do and seek options that are available to our students. And our financial coaching sessions will be a one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions that you can have. Currently, it's all virtual, so we will be um, meeting virtually, but it could be any questions regarding your money management, and I will be able to try to seek other resources that are available, but also I'm trying to help you and assist you to have better habits that you understand when it comes to money, managing your funds. Thank you for today. And it is our question session. And I, I believe we have covered a lot, but Elena, do you see more? Um, not specifically now. Um... So one student asked that their invoice balance has become a negative amount mm. after their studentship had been applied. Uh, do I need to pay the invoice anymore? No. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have, sometimes we get questions about that. It is a little bit confusing. If you see a negative balance owing, that means that's a credit to your account. So you could do two things. You can submit a refund request via Loris. And as per the scheduled refunding date noted on the refunding page, because uh, these things are not necessarily refunded ahead of the uh, term starting, um, you would then be in the queue to have your refund uh, deposited to your personal bank, um, as long as, of course, you've submitted uh, your personal banking information via the um, proper means for, for the refunding process to happen. Or you could leave that amount sitting on your student account and it would, again, once you get charged for winter term fees, it would simply be applied to your winter term fees. So it depends on whether you need the funds or not. So you can get a refund for the funds if it's a credit balance, or you can leave them sitting on your account. And it would, again, just be applied to whatever um, tuition and fee charges you have for the winter term or subsequent terms. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add... Um... Just the refunding process itself, it's not like a credit card refund where you could request it and you'll see it in like a couple of days. It, it just that the whole process does have timing just because students can make changes to your accounts or um, student courses or whatever you plan. It could fluctuate. So it does wait till a certain time to start that process for everyone. So you may not even if you request it early, you might have to wait a little bit. So the timeline of it um, may not meet what you're um, used to when it comes to uh, financial institutions or when they do a refund. It doesn't mean it's not coming. It's just the yeah. timing may not meet what, um, what you have expected it to be. Now, one, one thing that I do um, suggest is that if you do have a credit balance and um, because graduate students are different from undergraduate students yeah. in that your registration status, whether you're full-time or part-time, regardless of the number of courses that you're registered in, is actually driving your tuition charge. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you shouldn't be dropping courses or um, adding courses unless your program says uh, you need to in order yeah. to make sure you've got the, the correct things added uh, to your to your semester. But again, you're being charged for full-time tuition or part-time tuition is how that works. If you are in desperate need of some of the funds, you can reach out directly to me to discuss that with me. And it may be possible to um, request um, a, some of the funds that you have, depending on the source of the funds, where they're coming from and the amount and that sort of thing. We can look at that on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? So we had two more questions come in. I know we're kind of hitting the time. Um, we had, is there funding for part-time students? Most of the scholarships require students to be full-time. And then the workshop that's coming up, applying for external scholarships, master's level scholarships. Uh, how is that different from today's workshop? 
Okay. Do you want me to take this one, I guess? Yes, Sherry. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. So the first question um, was uh, related to, sorry, uh, part-time scholarships and availability and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, um, the majority of external scholarships and awards do require students to be full-time. Um, in terms of the general student profile, the internal scholarships and awards, however, there are uh, awards uh, through that um, profile that are available for part-time students. So again, make sure you fill that out if you're a part-time student. Um, you can also check scholarshipscanada.com. So again, that's scholarshipscanada.com. You do create a little bit of a profile and then you can filter based on your program, your part-time, full-time status, where you are in the province, that sort of thing. And it will match you with opportunities that you may or may not be eligible for. You can look at the opportunities and decide whether or not you want to apply. So that would be another good source. Um, additionally, um, for those of you who are um, um, interested and, and who are uh, receiving OSAP, there's always the Laurier Work Study Program as well. So you can look into that. If you Google Laurier Work Study Program, you can uh, check out what that's about it's doing a, basically a research assistantship um, and it provides you with some work experience and some funding obviously um, if you're eligible again there are uh, eligibility criteria for that and the master's scholarship program uh, sorry uh, session that I'm going to do is very different from this um, uh, session in that I'm going to go through uh, the different types of awards that are available to master's level students only uh, how you would apply where you would go um, your eligibility and that sort of thing. So it's going to be more focused specifically on those particular um, scholarship programs. Again, it will be recorded. So if you're not able to attend, you can access it afterwards as well. Thank you. Um, I think that's it so far. May I ask one quick question? <laughs> Um, the recording for this video, as well as any um, FAQs, or if, uh, again, I'm going to print the slides so that they're available in PDF format, would you be able to just explain, um, Alina, as to how that will be disseminated to um, students? Yeah, absolutely. So the recording uh, will be able to be found on the graduate student orientation page. It will take about a week to be transcribed and uploaded properly, uh, but we can also link it in the email with kind of the PowerPoint slides and everything. So it's an all encompassing package for students. Great. Okay. So are there any other questions that might be pressing at this moment, or is it something that we could probably address in the FAQ uh, page that we're going to uh, put together? 